Thanks for coming. We are very happy to have with us today uh, Joe Dabrosio from General Motors Research and Development. We've been collaborating with Joe in terms of our project we have together with uh, Vanderbilt and uh, Notre Dame on systems integration for such uh, separate physical systems. Joe is a lab group manager at General Motors Research Laboratories and he has been instrumental in our collaboration. Actually, they had now from here and return every year for the last three years. Right? He did his problems for one year and then uh, he turned for two years. And they're looking for more, I understand. So he has worked in the automotive industry for 25 years. And he's currently very much involved in modular based systems so and software development techniques, including virtual development, optimization, and multi core strategies. He served as a member of the USTAG and uh, also as an ISO technical expert in the ISO 2662 automotive function safety standard. So Joe has a very long experience with the uh, auto industry and what they do in systems engineering. So today he's going to talk to us about system engineering of GM's global automotive, electronics, controls, and software product line, current practice and challenges. So, okay. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here today to talk to you. I assume that the format John questions anytime people can raise their hands. What I'd like to do is to start off by giving an introduction. By introduction, introduction to myself, um, the organization I work for, GM, General Motors Research Laboratories, but also an introduction to some of the new technologies that are coming in electronics control software space uh, related to active safety, cameras, radars, and where we're headed in the future. You hear about the Google car, it's along that, that, that line of thought. So I'll give that type of an introduction. Then I'll go through and discuss a little bit about embedded systems development at uh, General Motors. It's surprising sometimes, but there are certainly a lot of people that you know, don't even know that there's software in the car. I don't suspect that's the case uh, for all of you, but uh, that's uh, certainly not. There's a lot of people that don't know what goes on inside General Motors in terms of delivering the cars that we sell today. And uh, the electronics and software make up a very significant part of that. Uh, there was a recent study that was done. I heard this from IBM, and it was specific in the context of a Ford vehicle, not a GM vehicle, but they assessed look at all the requirements. The 90% of the requirements that are written down are electronic software related requirements, 10% are mechanical related requirements. So it just really um, highlights, not necessarily the um, electronic software doesn't represent 90% of the cost, uh, but in terms of the complexity that, of the systems that we're dealing with and the, the level of uh, requirements that are that required electronics really drives the electronics and software. So I'll give a little bit of background on that. I'll talk about how we engineer our electronics and software to be able to deploy um, products across the globe. And this is one area that I think GM is a little bit uh, unique in, in the sense that we have a single global product line that is used to provide the electronics and software to every vehicle GM sells across the globe. This is different than how we used to operate in the past. We had all kinds of silos of uh, development with respect to electronics and software. That's not how we operate today. That's led to great cost savings for us, also warranty reduction, things of that nature. We'll talk about what's involved in doing that. And I've got some additional topics, depending on how much time we have, we can, we can go on for up this. So about myself, I've been in the automotive industry uh, my entire uh, career. I have a, a PhD from University of Michigan. I did work in the area of design optimization, uh, design methods there. Um, with respect to my work in the automotive industry, I've had the opportunity to work on a number of different things. Um, currently, I'm, I'm involved in model-based system development, model-based software development, and uh, uh, work on methods and processes for safety critical systems and uh, vehicle cybersecurity. Um, but over the past, I've had the opportunity to work on a number of things. I've, you probably can't see it so well, but there's a schematic up there. That's a hand-drawn schematic. It's a, a snapshot of the schematic from the uh, 6805 microcontroller. That's the first project I worked on at General Motors. This goes back to the 1980s. This was the controller that was in the radios at that time. But that hand-drawn schematic was basically three pages, each page the size of this, this screen. And that was our design representation that we worked from. And, um, and it was my job at that time to generate the test patterns to confirm as we manufactured these, because GM made these 6805s and GM plants at that time, to confirm that the products uh, were, were not faulted. And so, I was uh, basically working that schematic and an IBM mainframe computer and a batch type of system to run these, these, uh, these analyses. 
Um, I've also worked in the VLSI design area. There's a little diagram up there, one of the chips that I designed. That's a universal theft deterrent chip. Um, what's interesting about that is when I started with that, the existing universal theft deterrent that GM was using, this is back in the 80s again. So this is like, uh, you open up the door, how long the car door's been open, it has to do with locks and things of that nature. The schematic itself was this just rat's nest of logic gates and or types of gates. And so in terms of structured development methods, there was nothing structured at all about that. And so I took that as, a, it was actually part of a graduate project that I was working on, but I turned it into a product and went through a much more structured design. You really can't see it here, but basically that chip, there's some regularity in that chip. It's basically a big state machine, has a, a PLA a state, uh, a state machine, and a counter. And that counter I divided it in two from a design to test type of perspective. So it took a long time for this counter to cycle all the way through. By breaking it into pieces, you could basically cycle it in parallel and test it out. So some of the things that worked in the past. But uh, also, Quadrasteer was GM's first rear steer system that was put into production. Uh, went on our light duty trucks. That was back around the 2001 type of time frame. We no longer sell that. There's lots of talk offline about why that product didn't succeed in the marketplace. But that was basically a, a rear steer by wire system that we sold that would dramatically reduce the turning radius of trucks, which if you drive a big truck, you know that's important, but also improve the handling when you're pulling the trailer. I've worked on some prototype by wire systems, steer by wire, brake by wire. This diagram here is a project that we did for Harley Davidson when I was working at Delphi, which is a lean steer system. So this is these three wheel trike types of vehicles. So um, Harley Davidson doesn't want to sell necessarily a trike. So trikes, like either two wheels in front, one wheel in back, or one wheel in front, two wheels in back. Um, those trikes by some bikers aren't considered cool, right? So this system was basically bike but lean as you went around corners. So you had sort of the whole driving experience of riding a normal motorcycle, but the safety, if you will. Uh, and they were targeting some of the older drivers, you know, trying to be able to appeal to 55 plus that might not feel comfortable riding on a full-size Harley. So we designed the lean steer system for that, which was a bi hydraulic, electronic controlled hydraulic system. Um, more recently, I worked on the ISO 26262 functional safety standard. That came out at the end of 2011. That's really had a huge impact on the industry, so I was glad to have an opportunity in developing that. But that basically outlines sort of a minimal set of requirements from a process perspective, but also in terms of some design features of what's required to deploy uh, high integrity products that are safety critical. And there's a lot, you know, a lot of press even right now going on about some of GM's competitors with respect on the kinetic acceleration and things like that. This is intended to address those kind of issues so that those kind of issues don't, don't occur in GM. I work at GM Research. Our primary uh, location is in Warren, Michigan, which is uh, shown up here. Uh, but we're also a, a global organization. We have a lab located in Shanghai and a lab located in uh, Israel. We have an office that's located in Palo Alto. So my group, I'm a process and methods tools group, is a little bit unique in that uh, in our lab, uh, I'm the only one that has people in my group that are located in multiple locations. So I'm in Warren, I have people working for me in Warren, but I also have people, two people working for me in the Palo Alto office. And so they deal a lot of the Silicon Valley startup types of things. And uh, we work with Berkeley, for example, that's out there, but also companies like Synopsys and, and others. Phoenix Integration, where I'm doing Phoenix Integration on the Palo Alto office. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of an introduction to automotive electronics. This will just be very, very high level talk about a few of the technologies. But the you know, key thing here is the vehicles are, are going through a dramatic revolution in terms of how they are operating and how they are controlled. And electronics and software is at the heart of that. And so it's really a great time um, to be working in the automotive industry with respect to electronics and software because there's so many fundamental changes that are, that are taking place. I, I won't go through all of these, but basically saying that you know, the, the DNA that existed in vehicles for about 100 years is radically changing as the vehicles become electrified, as vehicles become connected, as they become more and more computer controlled, moving to autonomous driving, for example. Um, from our talk today, I'll talk a little bit more about control electronically. So things like the power steering systems, which were traditionally these uh, hydraulic steering systems. We are talking about that a little bit earlier this morning. Hydraulic power steering systems. Um, but basically, that there's a pump that has a, it's a pulley that's always a load on the engine with a hydraulic uh, system. And by going to uh, electronic power steering systems, it only operates, only draws energy when you actually need to have that assist, for example, turning in parking lots. So that helps to improve the fuel economy. And so GM's in the process of changing its entire fleet um, to electronic power steering. I think we're about 50% in terms of the, the vehicles that are out there on the road today. And here, they'll all pretty much be electronic power steering, except for our very heavy duty trucks. Those will still be uh, hydraulic. But I'll talk about controlled electronically connected vehicles, uh, both 
in the context of wireless communications to vehicles, but also from a sensor, uh, radar, camera type of perspective, connecting the vehicles to the environment. And also leading up to semi and uh, full autonomous driving. I'll talk a little bit about that. In fact, I'm going to focus more on some of these active safety products that touch on those three areas. So we have in um, production this year in our 2014 uh, model year Cadillacs, which you can buy um, today, this uh, driver assistance active safety package. Now we've had af active safety types of features in our cars before. I want to highlight this. This is a product that started off in GM Research where I work and represents an integrated design. So it's not a bunch of little pieces that provide individual pieces of functionality. This is an integrated design. It's making use of cameras, like front and rear view cameras, as well as radars, short range and long range radars, to provide a series of functionality, including things like on the awareness side, uh, lane departure warning and forward collision alerts. So that's using your forward camera. It looks and sees the lane markers, and if your vehicle starts to drift out of the lane, it can give you an alert. What's really neat about this vehicle specifically, we've had lane departure warning before, but this is integrated with the safety alert seat. And I, I serious, I really like this. So with the uh, lane normal lane departure warning, you're driving down the road and you move over a little bit and it beeps. Everyone in the car hears that it beeps, okay? That, but the issue is, I don't drive in the middle of the lane. You probably don't drive in the middle of the lane either. If there's a large truck next to me, I, you're always all over the lane. This thing's beeping all the time. It's really annoying. My children in the back seat, they cut at me, all that kind of stuff, right? The safety alert seat, there's no audible warning. If you're starting to drift off the left, it vibrates on the left-hand side of your seat. You feel that little bit of vibration. And it gives you immediately the awareness that, okay, it's now on the left side. It's not just some sort of beeping that takes place. And I really like that feature. So you couple that lane departure warning with that safety alert seat. I think that's a really good feature. Forward collision alert. It's using the camera to see vehicles in front of you. It looks at, it gets the speed from your brake controller. Try to see if you're closing too fast in the vehicle, it'll beep. Uh, driving in Detroit on the highways, there's lots of incidents where everyone's slamming on the brakes on the highways. This will basically alert you to those situations. And then side blind zone alert, uh, basically looking at the blind spots is a really good feature as well. There's others here, but these are basically things that provide information to the driver. Uh, and then there's the driver assistance package where we're actually doing you know, some type of autonomous controls. So it includes full speed range, ACC, will take you down to a stop. So it's using the radar. In this case, the see vehicles in front of you bring you down to a stop, uh, as well as um, like collision preparation, which will like, pre-charge the brakes and even apply the brakes if you're moving up into a situation where you're going to fly. It's not guaranteed to stop the collision, but it'll certainly take a lot of the energy out of the car. There's always a trade-off between, um, uh, I'll say, uh, the performance of the system, but also then false alerts, right? So these sensors are not 100% robust, and if it's falsely activating, giving a high B cell breaking event, that's not a good thing to occur. So that's why there's a little bit of trade off in those. And so these are all integrated? Yeah, so the only things, everything that's described in the slide, what's not directly integrated is the rear vision camera and the front and rear park assist. I mean, they are integrated in the sense they're connected by buses, but it's not part of a single design. Everything else is part of a single design. The design phase, are they integrated the system? Yes, absolutely. So they integrated the joint? Yes. And are they integrated with the mechanics of the car? Um, so the, the, the simple answer is no. Uh, when I say no, that um, the steering, braking, and throttle are all their own subsystems that stand alone. There's a requirements that have flowed down from the system. Can they give you some constraints in the system? With respect to the, the sensor, so it's more that um, the, from the mechanical side, of course, there's restrictions of where the sensors can be placed, and there's performance trade-offs, for example, and all of that. So that's certainly one area where there's some interaction between the mechanical side. Um, from the vehicle dynamics performance, there's typically some trade-offs that are made in terms of how these systems are set up and tuned. These systems, in general, don't drive the mechanical design so much. But they're built on top of the mechanical design. That's the best way I can describe it. But the zip when I try to break or keep the lane, or find the left part of the lane or the right part of the lane driver, and this is trying to adjust, Take into account the dynamic behavior of the car. Right? Absolutely. Right. So anything that you would like, we talked about using a, a, a simulate model of the control system interacting with the car sim model of the vehicle. That's all part of this. They understand those interactions. They've been designed to comprehend how the vehicle dynamics will respond to the commands that are coming from the, the software. What would be nice in the future is if cars would talk to each other. You know, ah. <coughs> so. So if you, the car in front of the car in front of you is. Accident. Okay, so that's, that's exactly what this is. 
um, and for the reasons that you're motivating, that um, often it's the case that something happens ahead and maybe there's some minor reaction, but then people start to sort of pile up and all of that. So vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications uh, is a technology that we've been working on for over seven years at GM Research. And now as a company, basically, we have it in our product plans to have a product release before the end of the decade that will have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications in it. So this is basically allowing vehicles to talk wirelessly to, um, to one another. This, you can use this to augment the radars and cameras because of kind of intersections there might be a building or something like that that's in the way the camera and radars can't see around that building. This basically allows uh, you to understand better what your environment is. In the U.S., from the U.S. government perspective, there's a strong push on vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. In Europe, it's more vehicle-to-infrastructure communications, so vehicle-to-the-light, traffic light, and things of that nature. So we're involved in, in both of that. But this is something that we I, you know, come to GM. We can give you demonstrations in these vehicles. You'll see that you know, um, hitting the brakes, you can communicate that back, several vehicles back, all that kind of thing. But it will be uh, headed for production here. Not all that, uh, all, not all of the distant future. Then you need all the parking days. Yeah, so um, it will have initially limited benefit, but the idea is likely that here in the U.S. at least that the government may give either a regulation that puts it all, onto all the cars, or the government may, through their safety standards, give you an extra star bonus. So in terms of the safety rating of the car, if you have this, it will increase your star rating. So there's going to be some type of incentive for car manufacturers. And it's also possible to install these types of devices aftermarket as well, though. You don't have to have it from a, you don't have to buy a new car to get that. Well, could there be some security issues, though, because cars could spoof and you can have Absolutely. people who are... That's a huge part of yeah. practical deployment of vehicle to vehicle. And, you know, and it's not just, I'll say, the encryption techniques, but you get the key management and all that kind of, the whole infrastructure that has to come behind that. And that was at least, I'm not involved in this on a day-to-day -day basis, but that was still part of some things that were unresolved. Not that they didn't have options but in terms of deciding how, how it would move forward. What are, what are some of the electrical kind of compatibility and interference issues? Yeah, so this is um, the, the specific, for the, the span here, I, I can't give you a detailed answer to that question, but it's, just to characterize it, it's uh, very similar to uh, the Wi-Fi protocol. It's another variant of the, of the Wi-Fi protocol. It's sort of like a mobile Wi-Fi. Uh, and so it's been, has some slight adjustments to deal with that. Um, clearly, it's not guaranteed there can be, if there's interference, it can interrupt this type of communication. So from uh, initial systems that you would see deployed would be more information-based. You know, so if you didn't get the information, you don't get the information, right? But you're not necessarily relying on operating the vehicle to depend on that. And as we see this progress, and I would think you would start to see more control actions coming in. Potentially, if someone slams on the brakes ahead, it could apply the brakes here. If you miss that signal, then it wouldn't do it Automated, in an automated fashion for you, but we'd still have the driver, in essence, still trying to be responsible. Because this isn't autonomous driving yet. This would just be things to augment. But yes, there can be interference to those. those they things. didn't have to right? Yes. Yes. And that's what this is based upon. It's called the Dedicated Short Range Communications DSRC. Then here, with respect to autonomous driving, so, so basically, we have a sensor suite of cameras and radars, so you know what's going on outside the vehicle. And if you combine that with GPS and map technology, you're, you're in a position to, to operate the vehicle autonomously. And you, you know, you're at Google uh, doing this. For GM, um, back in 2007, we developed a concept vehicle it's called the BOSS uh, vehicle. And we entered that into darkest urban challenge, and, and GM was partnered with Carnegie Mellon and Continental, and we won that urban challenge, which Basically, you had to operate this vehicle autonomously. It's this very dynamic uh, environment. So that was really our introduction to autonomous driving. If you look on top, you'll see all kinds of sensors. It's like $60,000 Validine sensor with some LiDAR looking around the car. This is a great example of the money they get. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and now, here's our integrated design. This vehicle is called the uh, Envy. And in addition to using the types of sensing technologies that the boss had, it also includes the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle, uh, communications. This is a concept vehicle that GM has produced. It was uh, displayed in the Shanghai World Expo. GM had a pavilion there, and we were able to demonstrate various types of things, including like we're tuning of vehicles through vehicle-to-vehicle -to -vehicle communications. It's, uh, NV stands for Electric Networked Vehicle. So electric, this is a you know, fully electric vehicle based upon lithium-ion um, batteries. 
network, both in terms of the sensing radar cameras as well as the vehicle vehicle communications. If you look closely, this is a two-wheel vehicle. This is a concept for an urban environment where very you know, tight operating conditions, and so this can do zero turning radius, so parking, all of those kinds of things. Um, I mean, the, the vision is that uh, a family, I have four children, a family, I could own three of these, right? And we could drive down the road in platooning fashions, or I could at some point send my one off to park my kids and let them off at school. I mean, that's, that's the kind of concept. And I have a video here that's going to illustrate a little bit of this. These vehicles are real, first of all. I want you to understand. I've seen them. Yeah. <laughs> I've driven one. <laughs> I've, I've, I've driven the, we call it the mule vehicle. It didn't look as pretty as that. I've driven the mule vehicle. I've written in that specific one um, myself. I'm going to show you a video here in a moment. So this video will demonstrate some of the things it actually does, but it also represents a vision for the future. And you'll see some things in here that you'll probably say, oh, I don't know about that. But a lot of this from a technology perspective is absolutely realizable. I just want you to understand that. So there's some audio here. It's really just music. So, so yeah, Eco City, where we're deploying is a thing. So this, the supplier on this with us was Segway, which is a two-wheel vehicle. Not surprised there. Unintended 
is being built today with like a 64 megabyte file system. So the complexity of the device is just continuing to grow and grow. How we develop the, the control functionality and the software we've got through phases, starting off back like in 1981 where we were doing everything in assembly language. Um, shortly after 1990, we needed to do something that was more structured. Uh, but the assembly language code for like entry control became this big ball, right? You couldn't do anything with it. You couldn't touch anything that was there because no one knew all the dependencies and how it worked. You could only add on to it. Um, so we went through and we threw that entirely out um, and we engineered using a language called Modular GM. You know, back in the 1980s, GM was big enough, right? We could have our own programming language, which was <laughs> based upon Modular, which was like Ada or like Pascal, depending on which um, that was a very good structured program language, but there was a drawback in that just there wasn't a whole lot of people coming out of universities that were trained in programming in modular GM, right? So eventually that move to structured program language was a good thing, but it created problems for us as well. So then we started to move more to using, I'll say, more standards like ANCC, more in the late 90s. And then for us in the early uh, 2000s, where we began our transition to what we call model based code generation. So we're using tools like Simulant State Flow or wraps that you define the behavior, and now we generate code off of that. And with respect to um, new products that we're developing today, it's almost primarily done from software that GM writes, not software our suppliers provide, but software GM writes, it's almost primarily done from model-based code generation. We have lots of legacy code still. If we don't need to change it, we don't go back and, we don't go back and engineer it. The types of systems we develop, very loosely, we put into three categories, deeply embedded, moderately embedded and lightly embedded. So deeply embedded would be things like steering, braking, throttle control, lots of real-time control, um, real-time deadlines. We use tools like Simulink, uh, state flow to develop those. Um, the moderately embedded would be things more like a body controllers or the time scales. There are timing requirements. You know, if you push the button on your, your window, maybe you don't want to wait three seconds before the window starts to move, but there's much more lax types of requirements. To what we call lightly embedded, which still have actually strong performance constraints, but these are more like our infotainment systems. So these really aren't controlling um, motors and things of that nature, but there are still performance requirements related to video streaming and things like that. Depending on the class of system, we engineer those with slightly different set of tools. Can you use the user software that you can take to represent? Yeah, so Autostar is not deployed, so there's a difference, you know, so we're using Autostar now on the engineering side, but it's not deployed in products that you would buy from here. No. If you buy a GM vehicle today, it won't have Autostar on it. I think our timing would be more like model year 2017. So one thing to realize um, is that um, prior to the Autostar, GM had already come up with its own version. This started around 2003 to 2004. So it was basically a GM version of Autosar. Autosar didn't exist. So for those of you who don't know what's Autosar, Autosar is a standard software architecture. So it, it basically sets out a standard set of drivers that the application can run on. So if I think from an adaptive cruise control perspective, if I separate the adaptive cruise control from the operating system, the memory management, the diagnostics, and things like that, Autosar is sort of helping address all those lower level services. And it basically allows you to take a software component that represents part of the application, move it from one controller to the next, you know, basically run immediately. We already have our own version of that inside, and so in essence, we're not desperate to change, and so we're trying to uh, basically wait to the right time point to convert, converge what one methodology on our powertrain side, this Autostar-like methodology, plus real Autostar all into one. We have to support all these products being sort of sold at the same time. We don't start every year and sort of throw away everything. And we have a vehicle itself will, will be manufactured. The, the base design lasts about five years. So you'll have this long legacy of a vehicle that maybe is in its fifth year and a new vehicle that's coming out. So it'll be this whole range of technologies. And we have to support all of those, in essence. Yeah, who from the European competitors you have looks at that Yeah, I don't know in terms of actually deployed, deployed products, but clearly like BMW and Daimler are very much you know, into it, absolutely, as, as are we. But I don't know if they have it in their products that they're selling to them. Um, no, so it's, you know, uh, talk about innovation in the automotive area. Uh, there's sometimes, you know, I, I work for GMR and D, and we're supposed to innovate. Um, there's complaints that all the automotive manufacturers work with the same set of suppliers. So we see the same ideas over and over again, right? right? So BMW and Daimler suppliers aren't necessarily that different than, you know, our suppliers include Bosch and Continental, which are, which are German suppliers. So 
it's, uh, there's a lot of sharing in that aspect. If you want to innovate, sometimes you've got to move out of that supply chain, basically, to, to really go and have something that's not home. Cybersecurity type of perspective. Yeah, so we have a team that works on that and we develop requirements. And I don't know who's sourcing um, some of the lower level components per se, but we have a request set of requirements that will apply to some of our future. So we, have, we had a workshop here in December of 2012 mm -hmm. on uh, the cybersecurity of vehicles. And, and people from the company can use it from everybody else. And some of the uh, things that we were discussing that meeting were very alarming. From how easy it is to steal a car, to go to some advanced features where you actually have no key, and they can steal the signal to the point where they can come in and control the engine and all kinds of stuff, to the point of advanced was actually before it started to go through the vehicle communication. Absolutely. Can do that. Right. And so there's certain specific subsystems of the car have had a security focus in the past, would include like the telematics uh, and some of the engine with respect to tampering and things like that. Uh, but other areas have not at all had a security focus, and you see that. Sometimes things are not so easy to get to, to, to hack just because of some of the, not because they put specific protection in for hacking, but because of, I'm uh, sure, uh, fail silent behavior in the vehicles. There are certain things that have to correlate, and if you don't get everything to correlate properly, you won't necessarily get the behavior, but it really depends on the specific element of an engineer. Um, as we design these systems, we have both closed loop controls, use classical control system design, we use tools like Simulink, Safe Flow to develop that, and state based systems like our body control, which is controlling the, the door locks, the windows, the wipers, things of that nature. This is really just a lot of state machines. And that's we can use a tool like RAP so you can capture that behavior. We have non safety critical and safety critical systems. Um, for non-safety critical, we're typically always doing a failure mode defense analysis, at least I mean, we, we want to have good product quality in general, whether it's a safety critical system or not. But if it's a safety critical system, then there's a whole bunch of other things that sort of get layered on top that we do to try to ensure the integrity of those products. Um, the products we sell today are basically fail-safe systems, which means if there's a problem with that system, we really just want to detect it and want to turn it off. So like a power steering system or a cruise control system, all those kind of things, we just turn it off. But as we move forward in the future, and I talked about the super cruise feature, now you're starting to see the introduction of fail operational types of systems, which we are not all that mature yet in terms of engineering, and uh, so we'll, we'll walk before we run. For model based system development, using tools like for algorithm signaling, state flow, and rhapsody, for plant modeling, there's a variety of products depending on the specific nature of the plant, the signaling saver. GT power for our engines, AIMSIM for transmission, CARSIM for overall vehicle dynamics. So you see a variety of these tools being used are the most appropriate tool for the specific domain. Um, for things like non-functional system properties, like timing analysis or resource analysis, of, as our, our, our CAN bus, which is the serial communication bus among the modules, is that overscheduled? Is there too much on there? We use tools like sim to s from SimDivision to do that kind of analysis, or space timing analysis. On the electrical side, we're using tools like Design Architect for Mentor to do schematic capture, Siemens NX Team Center to do um, wiring harness, um, um, physical layout of the wiring harness. And then just from overall process matters, things like doors to do requirements management, gears to do product line management, which I'll talk about, uh, Rhapsody, um, Rational Team Concert to do, to do change management, CM Synergy to do configuration version control. Just an example of some of the tools that we're so is the design the system engineering process broken or do you try to replace those two process? How do you Yeah, so um, with respect, that sort of brings me to let me just so talk about product line engineering. So what we've done over the last um, five years is uh, we've consolidated our development methodologies with non specific Talking specifically in the context of electronics, controls, and software. But we've consolidated our design methodologies such that across the entire globe, we're following a standard set of processes. We're using a common set of tools. Now, depending on what the group is engineering, they may use simulator, another group might use graphs to capture that behavior. 
but we commonize the tools in the sense that if you're doing state-based design, you're always using Rhapsody. If you're doing control design, you're always using the single. We've got a common core set of tools. So a single process is being deployed um, throughout the company, and all of the electronics and software is basically being developed to that, to that process. So I don't know if that answers your, your question. Uh, yes, my main concern was about uh, keeping track of the consistency design process when, when the model goes through different tools like that. Okay. Yeah, so that's one of the big challenges that we have today is this, the tools are not well integrated at all. And um, from a requirements traceability type of thing, you start from the beginning and go all the way down to the design and the, the test patterns that come out of that, you're jumping across multiple tools. And that's one of the areas that we're very much focused working with companies like IBM is one of our partners that uh, uh, we're working with to try to provide solutions with that. So um, I'd say we're much better off than we were five years ago, but it's not at all a solved problem for us. We still have data that's spread across multiple tools, and as of today, we don't have a good solution. We've, we've looked at tools like well, IBM has a tool called RAM, Rational Asset Manager. Um, that didn't work well for us. Um, we tried to do some case studies with that. Uh, there's the OS and LC to integrate the tools, so we're looking at that. And, and also, tools that don't support OS LC, there's another tool they have called RHEL. Right. Uh, right. And RHEL kind of sits on top, it's like a web kind of allows you to link things across. So, those are the specific tools that we're looking at using today. But that's all work in progress for us. How many staff do you have to have in order to maintain all the tools? And yeah, so. Uh, it's hard for me to assess to give you an exact number because we have our IT organization and I, I don't really don't know uh, the numbers behind the scenes in the IT organization. We have dedicated parts of the IT organization that focus exactly on these, these tool chain and then we have our own personnel who sort of more the, uh, they're not the users but they're the experts with respect to understanding the GM use cases and so they are like IT people um, but they are the ones that really are working with the design teams on a day-to-day -day type of basis. And so we have one group uh, that, that manages the products like Doors and National Team Concert. That group is about uh, 25 to 30 people. Uh, but then we're heavily engaged with our own internal IT organization and then external organizations like IBM. A lot. I mean, I, I can't give you an exact number, but there's a lot of a lot of individuals, a lot of costs associated with all of that. Mm -hmm. So, talk about product line engineering. And so, basically, what we're, we're, we're doing here is we're consolidated how we develop our products and we manage it as a single large product line that's deployed across all of our vehicles. And so we have a number of challenges here. Um, we have the space of developing electronics and software, about 3,000 engineers located across the globe that interact uh, to develop these products. We partition the vehicle down into subsystems. There's about 300 hierarchical subsystems that we define, steering, braking, things of that nature. We have thousands of uh, variant features, and we gave, in talking to John earlier this morning, this example of when you sell cars in different parts of the world, you can have different requirements. And when we first started to sell cars in India, we had immediate warranty problems with the horns. So guess what? A horn that lasts the entire life of the vehicle in the United States lasts about three months. <laughs> because that's, they have their own vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, right? <laughs> so you know, that's, that's humorous. But that's wireless. Wireless. Yeah, it's wireless. <laughs> wireless communication. But that's what we have to deal with in selling products across the, the world. So we end up having to support lots and lots of variants in our products. So we have millions of product instances per year. We sell about, I think, 9 million vehicles across the globe each year. But if you look at those 9 million, there are about ten, tens of thousands of those that represent unique product combinations. And we engineer that from a single product line. Uh, talked about the, uh, the government regulations, um, competitive pressures. Basically, we, we, we need to get. A, we're a big company. We need to get economies of scale if we're going to benefit from the size. If you're a big company, there's always some bureaucracy, right? And so, if you're doing things in all different ways, and you've got this bureaucracy on top of it, you're going to lose in the marketplace. And so, GM is very much trying to succeed through economies of scale, but still differentiate products where customers care, and get the economies of scale where customers don't directly care. And so whether you have a flex ray bus or three CAN buses, the customer doesn't care about that. They care about what they're getting from a features type of perspective, right? So this whole behind the scenes, we're trying to engineer the common product line with the ability to tailor the solutions, though, 
across the globe. We basically found in order to achieve, you know, help reduce the cost of our products, improve the quality, and, and also improve the speed and our ability to deploy by making use of standardization, which you know, leading to reuse of these, these artifacts, can really get us the volumes that, you know, in the context of the economy of scale, and also help us address these complexity issues that we're facing, as well as you know, safety, security, and, and dealing with our global footprint. Um, go on. So we enable massive reuse of our core set of assets by using these product lines. And so we're basically developing a set of systems, and those systems are based upon a common set of features that can be tailored. And the common set of features is based upon a common set of building blocks to construct those, those features. And why do we do it this way? And we've seen that once we've put the initial investment in, that the effort to produce another, get another vehicle is reduced by about 85% when we have this common product line. Again, there's cost overhead in maintaining a common product line, but we're seeing dramatic reduction in terms of producing vehicles. And also from a warranty perspective, about a 70% reduction, up to a 70% reduction in warranty because the problem's fixed on one vehicle because it's a common source. It's now fixed for other vehicles that would use that product as well. And the way this basically works then is we start from our advanced ideas, which this is not within the product line. We're developing new features like the active safety features we talked about. Once those have reached a mature level, they're brought into our, our product line and managed as part of the product line. There's an engineering step that take place that you go through and parameterize these artifacts so that they can be deployed in multiple ways. And from this product line, we have this big toolbox, we come up with a standard set of deployments. There's potentially billions of combinations of product, individual products that we could, we could deploy out of this, but we don't do that. We limit the sets that we generate to a standard set of deployments represented here, and then we put the standard set of deployments into individual vehicles. And integrating them with the vehicles, there may be um, some changes that are needed, and those are brought back through a change management process into the product line. So again, if I need to make an update for a component so it fits into this SUV, that's engineered not as I've spun it off and now it's a tailored product for this SUV, it's still part of the product line. We have multiple threads in the product line, we call them streams, that we basically have to manage so we can work on vehicles that are not only going to be sold in 2014, but those will be sold in 2016 with kind of different technology. So there's multiple of these streams. Basically, it's all coming back to this core uh, product line. And this is this slide is basically saying the same thing. We think in terms of the V diagram, that each one of these being the features that go into our product line, there's a V associated with each one of those. Once they've gone through the V, they go into the product line, you might have multiple versions with different capabilities. And then those are basically put on to individual vehicles like the Chevrolet Bolt or the Moody Regal, for example. So you're picking out versions of these elements and instantiating them on the vehicle program. How far back in time do you maintain? It, it basically, um, you know, I don't have the exact answer to that, but, we, it's, but it's not only just like the software, it's the tooling. Yeah, so we, we uh, as a consequence of this, is as you do this, is we don't always update to the latest version of the tool. We, we batch up our updates, so I think we're using MathWorks uh, 2010B or something like that for simulating. And uh, so we, we're not updating the tool chain on a day, you know, each revision. So we sequence these things, but then we have to archive them. And it's in our contracts, by the way, that it's, that's part of the difficulty in dealing with uh, tool vendors is GM puts in its terms and conditions that they have to put their software in escrow so the company goes bankrupt, that we can basically get access to the source code. So absolutely, um, whether we work, I say, in product line or not in product lines, we have to be able to maintain that, that history and go back and be able to fix, you know, if there's a problem with a vehicle that was sold in 2007 and we need to fix the software in there, we have to be able to go back and, and do that. So I don't, I don't know the exact timing on that, but it has to be maintained for a good period of time. How do you educate people about the product line also? I mean, you have sort of engineers moving on and off projects and new people coming into the organization or coming from other companies. How do you uh, uh, yeah, orient them around? I mean, there's this? a whole set of training classes that go with this, and a lot of those are done. We, we've recorded them done online, uh, basically types of training classes, but it's also a big culture aspect. That this is the way we work. This is it. And um, talked about uh, before that if you look at the, uh, the
Good thing your car is up to this. Yeah. Yeah. You should be patch updates on that. That's once every several years. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> you can actually make We're a long up to actually buy a machine. You never update so much. So the, the challenges in doing a product line um, include that you have to have you have to have a perspective from a vehicle perspective. You have to engineer an individual vehicle. So there you have to have teams that are focused on engineering the vehicle, and you have to have teams that are focused on engineering the products. And so from a vehicle perspective, you, you think of your vehicle as being you know, your world, and you flow down the requirements to the various types of components that are going to be built into your vehicle. But from a component type of perspective, your component is your world. You have multiple vehicle requirements that are flowing down. It's basically the merger of those two um, aspects, and we manage both of those. We have teams that are assigned to the vehicle, teams that are assigned to the products. And we use, again, using a suite of tools. Um, today we're using a lot of tools uh, from IBM, but there's another tool that one thing that we're doing different um, is we're explicitly modeling feature dependencies. We're using a tool by a company called Big Leader Gears. And I have an app. It comes back, I have an example I can show you. But you, you model the product line, you model all of the variant points. And so you'd say, for example, that um, for my, uh, my display system, I might either have a heads up display, or I might have a warning chime, or I might have a light. And there's a logic basically that you use to. Oh. <laughs> Maybe I should have put it okay. Okay, no, it means not okay. No, it's a mistake. Don't put okay. Um, Didn't give you any other choice. But anyway. Yeah, so you, you, you model the logic of that product line. And now you basically have a high, way, high level uh, way to understand what that product line is. And you can use that product line logic to generate the specific product line instances. And How do you mention the logic of the game? So this tool Gears is what we're using. There's other tools like Pure Variance. There's, there's tools out there that capture this product line information. So we can explicitly model the product line. Um, you, know, you could say, well, can't you just all do that with uh, configuration management tools? And the answer is, yeah, you, you can manage. And in the back end, it is all configuration management tools. But by modeling it at explicit as a product line, you can now reason about it as a product line. And you can understand those dependencies as opposed to having it just sort of all blurred into your, your configuration management system. So that's basically the approach that we are using. And that's coupled, we've worked with uh, IBM to couple that into doors. So this was always a huge challenge for us when we produce a vehicle. What are the requirements for that vehicle? Who knows what the requirements are for that vehicle? How, how do you tailor it down, given that we have these thousands of different types of uh, instances with respect to the, the, the artifacts? And so now, basically, we've, we've modeled the product line, and we can select the very so the product line, the requirements, we have those. Well, it's, you know, in essence, these are sort of parallel entities, but by modeling the product line, I can go into doors, and if I configure a specific instance in the product line, I can put that into doors, and we put in logic that identifies. So in the past, we used to have like a requirement, a text of requirement say, if this is a diesel engine, it would be in the text of the requirements. Now that's all torn out. And it just it picks the requirement based upon. And you said it with a nice point, though. You know, you know, maybe you go uh, by going to go. <laughs> you said it with a very nice logic position yes. for the planet. And the other way, you cannot pay the uh, doors. The problem is now you don't get doors close to yes. the IBM tools, right? Yes. And that becomes another nightmare. Right. You press it up, I think, doors. So doors is where our requirements are at, and our product line is separate. The intent, the long-term intent, is to have that product line model interface with all of our tools. Right. That's, that's the goal. So when we specify an instance, we can, it doesn't matter what data we want, where it's at. Is it important for you to have the requirements in there? Um, I'd say that's more a legacy position. Because you just go directly to the mathematization requirement. Right. Yeah, today it's all text-based. 
both visual text and then. Yeah, and, and the big change for us has been as we went from text-based documents, and we said we want to bring them into this new framework where I, I didn't have time to talk about it, but we're doing functional design. We basically separate the function from the implementation. A lot of the requirements that we had in our Word documents were more like design specifications. They weren't high-level requirements. And so we, we re-engineered our requirements effectively to be things that are totally separate from the implementation. Uh, those that are totally, they might have some reflective implementation that are separate from a vehicle instance, and then those related to a vehicle instance. And those are all you know, now separated and managed. And that was the big effort. We're still in the process of doing that uh, today. That brings up another question that I've been puzzling about, that is, when you have a product line, and I think this is sort of a, a general product line an issue of design in a product line environment, in some sense, you, uh, in the traditional V, you start with, you have your, the requirements, and you go through design, and you get the implementation, then you go up the verification branch in the V diagram. But here, you have the, the product line is almost sits in the middle of the descending branch of the V. And so, to get the most bang out of the product line buck, you want the people writing the requirements to be aware of the product line so that they can write their requirements in a way that ensures maximum use of the product line. On the other hand, then you're sort of letting the design bleed into the requirements right. a little bit and it sort of damages innovation or can. Right. It's not so, so the way that typically works in practice is that if we're developing a brand new function in the future, um, with respect to that, the initial development work is done totally outside of the product line type of concept. Uh, but if it has to plug into existing capabilities, then those are coming out of the product line. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm worried about this behavior, but it has to get vehicle speed over here. So I'm not going to come up with my own version of vehicle speed. So I pull out the things that I need to interface it to the vehicle. I fully innovate it and go through multiple phases until it gets to a point where we're happy with that concept. But we don't accept the actual models that are, or the code that's produced as what will go into engineering, it goes through another phase then okay. to get it into the product line. So okay. we don't try to over constrain the innovative aspect to always be within. In fact, you know, my, I, I work mostly in R&D and mass development my entire career. And you don't want to have this highly structured process of you know, requirements flow down and have to go back and change everything. You want to have things much more free form when you're doing that innovative phase. But once you're through that phase and do some work to make the concept a little more robust, then we would transition it into the much more structured. So you do like this rap prototyping out, outside of the product line, and then when the prototype looks good, then you sort of re-engineer, do the version, re-engineer the prototype so that it plugs into the rest of the engineering framework. Right. Okay. And so it's my understanding that there's about um, 3,000 change requests we process a year, and all this is very strictly controlled, that are more just the incremental within the product line. There are about 300 requests that involve bringing new technology into the product line. The development of that new technology is outside of all of that, whether you have an R&D or a supplier. But, uh, so there is a methodology for doing that, but the vast majority of the work that's done on a daily basis is within inside the context. There's incremental changes in the product line. Okay. I know, I think that's all the time we have. Table of four to five here. So you're welcome to come. Right. I didn't show the slide to so the guide here, but if you want to talk about multi core, I don't know. Multi core or uh, CPS, cyber physical systems, I think it's virtual development. I can talk about all those things. Okay. So I have a question. How do you. Uh, okay. So if, you, if you're familiar with the IBM tools, there's a lot of logic that you have to go from. Um, from the model, like a uh, system model of scheduling uh, instruction, something like a trade of analysis and so on. And you would like to be able to annotate the system and block from requirements so that this will be captured over when I do a trade of analysis. And system and has now the requirements that are on the primary variable. So can you go from your product line through your requirements directly to the requirements and primary variable and step down? How do you do it? Yeah, so there's um, a Doris Rhapsody bridge, okay, and we, we bring the requirements in, uh, and it's a one-on-one -on -one replication inside of Dor, I mean inside of Rhapsody, and then the links are made inside of Rhapsody um, to the, the high-level design elements that are basically represented inside of design and inside of Rhapsody. Is that to use the 
to the bad yankers to go to different directions. Yes. That's so what I'm not to, correct me if I'm wrong, if IBM is very strong in linking these two requirements and uh, it's parametric diagram for the money, I don't think so. Yeah, I, and I'm not sure. I think we can import the wrap the doors to come. But still do requirements diagrams and parametric diagrams in IBM wraps are the money. Yeah, so, so basically when you import it, you lose some connectivity between those yeah, uh, components. If they had a product line, I'd like to be able to go from the product line to the automatic annotation of requirements, right? Yeah, I think that, that's why they say they have uh, Otherwise, I can yeah, okay, find some so way to do it that way, but that's the way I would like to do it. And then I can tell us to direct loop back from the trade-off, even to the point where if I want to do collaborative requirements, where is it been? If I want to do collaborative requirement analysis, I can actually use the, the simplest speed to find if we agree on the requirement or not. Very quickly, if I have different groups this way. And I can Maybe the idea to have tailored tools for their needs. Your body, you want to show any other slides? No. Oh, no. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Because the trouble I hear from Copan is that this manual thing is where they get killed. Because A, a lot of people don't know, and B, is not intuitive, and not repeatable. So then they have to buy services from various companies to do it for them. Or they go to the big vendors and they do it. This is very good for the vendors, but not very good for the company because they don't own what's going on. So that's a big problem. One last question. Do you have what's called a Nishapra? Uh, do you have do you have the so-called front-end problem? Right? So we hear a lot of companies, and I told you this in breakfast, that they have a problem about how they enter into this modern day system and environment for their average and they, they cannot afford to train them with all these tools and all that stuff. And they want to be able to go from a specialty engineer to be able to populate some of these things with requirements or other things easily. And then easily means either in the express domain language or common tools and then automatically get part of the system. Do you start on that? Is that a problem? Where I've seen more of that is in, in some analysis techniques that take a certain level of effort, like use of formal methods. This right. is one that comes up right away that's been very difficult oh, yeah, for us to make pro progress on formal methods because of barrier between the and the practitioner. Um, with respect to the organization as, as a whole, I mean, uh, yes, there are training challenges. Where you're saying like, like domain-specific languages that allow them to then interact in the framework that they, they would like to work in. I mean, so like our algorithm engineers, they, they are happy with the simulant environment in general. Right. So in, in our development process, there are different roles, and in one, any one individual doesn't stand all of the roles, right? right? So like in advanced development, we might have a person that does five or six different roles, where within product engineering, they're, they're doing one or two roles. So the scope of what they're working in is, is not typically that broad of a scope, but sometimes the data, the th things that they need to access absolutely transition across these boundaries. And that's a huge challenge for us is being able to give them the information that they need. They're only doing a small, in the end, they're only doing one little thing, if you want to think of it that way, but they need some context to work in, and it's that context to work in that is often a big challenge for us. Any other questions? All right, thanks.